Hello brothers and sisters, this is your boy BC. Welcome back to the Based LDS video. And today we're going to talk about uh, some more doctrines of traditional Christian faith. And we're going to talk about the soli. Uh, soli is plural for the sola, the five sola. Um, we've briefly mentioned them before. And these give the weight to the confessions, especially the Westminster Confession we talked about last week. Um, real quick, this is going to be a quick skim of each of them. This is not going to be anything in depth. Um, if you want something in depth, let me know. That can be done, but this is just going to be a quick look into it, uh, what each one is and what they do for traditional Christianity, and a little bit into why the church has problems with the soli. Um, and they're not big. There are things that we would easily accept, but on the whole, we, there are some errors. There are just some errors. Um, and uh, anyway, I hope you enjoy. And I've upped my game. How about some PowerPoint? Yeah, I know you like that. I know you like that. So these are the soli. It's a picture of Martin Luther in front of the Council at the Diet of Worms, where he's giving a last chance to recant and come back to the faith. And he, quite frankly, bravely says no. And you know what? Let, let me do this real quick. Um, we do not agree with traditional Christianity, with the modern mainstream version, as far as the doctrine and the beliefs. But we do need to acknowledge that the early church fathers on down to present day did a good job preserving the bulk of the faith. Um, as LDS, we readily acknowledge that there, an apostasy was going to take place. But that world back then right at the time of Jesus' death, was brutal, harsh, and cold. And as prophecy and revelation were being lost, these men did the best they could to preserve the faith and to expand it out of a small niche in the Middle East and around the, Mediter the rim of the Mediterranean and into the whole of the world. And it would affect... Western civilization and European history greatly. We don't have to agree with everything they said and did. Yes, there were some abominations like the Inquisition. But they kept the word alive. They preserved the Bible to the best they could. And they, they held on to things enough so that when a time for a restoration came in 1820, that there was something there that people could recognize. There was something there that people saw and went, this is the way the true religion should be. Because uh, that's what it was for a lot of people, right? Joseph Smith's father and grandfather, Wilford Woodruff, many others, they were looking for a more biblical Christianity because they did not see any of the denominations in that day as having what a Christian church should have. The Church of Christ should have a hierarchy of prophets and apostles. It should have revelation. It should have authority, power. So, now, very quickly, the sola are not an outgrowth of Catholicism or Eastern Orthodoxy. They are an outgrowth of the Protestant Reformation. They were recognized by the Reformers. Uh, so these are 500-year-old doctrines. They're the core tenets of the Christian church for mainstream 
Christianity today. And they're not spelled out point by point by Luther or anyone else, but they recognize the power of each one of these. So we're going to get into the history a little bit. So here we go. And real quick, the Protestant Reformation, because you have to have a Reformation before you can have the soul to become active. The Reformation began in the late 15th century, so 1400s, as a means of criticizing certain aspects of the Catholic Church. Uh, the tradition seemed to override some of the scripture. Uh, indulgences, where you could pay for sins in advance. Um, some of the actions of the clergy, some of the, just the things going on, people would criticize. So people began to look at Catholicism in a new lens. Martin Luther, on October 31st, 1517, this is traditionally the day given as the day he posted his now famous 95 Theses to the door um, that, that it was an official declaration of here are the problems with the Catholic Church as he saw them. And this was the spark that set the Reformation ablaze. Another thing that helped, the publishing of the Tyndall Bible set a standard for publishing scripture in commonly spoken language, English at the time. Allow, this allowed uh, greater access to the Word of God and further expanded reformist efforts. So, until then, the scriptures were available in Latin and Greek. Uh, you would have your church services in Latin. The people didn't speak Latin. They don't know what's going on. They're being told what's being said and what means what. They don't have the scriptures to see it for themselves. So the scriptures becoming available to the public and Martin Luther, a Catholic priest, recognizing problems with Catholicism and officially announcing these issues and calling for a reform of the Catholic Church set the world afire. And from there, many, many other Reform and Protestant theologians came to the forefront. Uh, so you get Martin Luther, of course, and he would eventually found Lutheranism, the Lutheran Church. Uh, a man named Huldrych Zwingli, and I'm sure I'm saying that wrong. He was a Swiss reformer. Uh, he died before he could found uh, the church that he was envisioning um, in, quite frankly, a war in, I think it was France at the time, or on the border of the French Swiss, but anyway, um, fighting with other religionists. Um, however, people that were his disciples, I guess you would call them, or students, would go on to form the Anabaptists. Uh, you get John Calvin would form Calvinism. John Knox would form Presbyterianism in Scotland. Um, and there are many other, I mean, there is a long list of the others, but these are some of the main guys, to my mind, the main people when it comes to the kickoff of the Protestant Reformation. So, what is Protestant and Reformed theology? And again, this is general, folks. This is not specific. But adherents to Reformed theology are bound together by their views on the corruption of the Catholic churches in practice, tradition, counsel, and doctrine. For many Reformers and Protestants, the key difference is reliance upon the church for Catholics is what they saw it. Catholics relied upon the church for their salvation. And the Protestants and Reformers, their idea of personal salvation is that God worked individually through them rather than having to go through the church for salvation. Now, the reason you have so many Reformers, once they started getting more into the Scriptures, they have different ideas upon what's more important. So what divides them is their interpretations of the Scripture and how they read them. For instance, let's just talk a big one. Baptism. And this, this, this gets a little bit into the solace, but baptism is considered a work. 
is baptism, is baptism necessary? For some reformers, the answer is no. For other reformers, they read the scriptures and go, well, Christ says be baptized and believe. So yes, you have to have baptism. So you get some on a no, then some in a yes. Well, then those in the yes camp are like, well, how should we be baptized? Should it be immersion? Should it be sprinkling? And then you get them looking at each other and going, and at what age should the people be baptized? And so you get different divisions among the reformers as far as how to set up a church, what practices to practice. Um, some of the other things you get into are the other sacraments, like the Eucharist, or as we would call it, the sacrament, the bread and the, the, the host and the wine, bread and the water for us. Um, marriage, how should it be performed? Who by who? Uh, ecclesiastical authority. You, so many differences. And so you do get a lot of breaking and splintering. However, again, as was stated in the Confessions, a lot of these churches, they disagree, but they agree that salvation is still available through basic core doctrines that they all adhere to or believe in. So you and I can have a different view on baptism, but if we agree about the soli, then... Our doctrines are still basic. Our doctrines are still uniting. And it's these, the sola, that make salvation clear. They define how salvation is going to take place. So let's get into the first one. And again, these are going to be very brief because there's a lot to cover. And also, as you can imagine, with each of these very different denominations you're going to get slightly different takes. So what I say here, please take as general information. A Presbyterian might look at it one way, an Episcopal another, a Baptist another way, a Lutheran another. You get the idea. They agree to the basic body of the premise in the statement, but maybe they'll have slight twists between each one of them. Or maybe 10 of them will agree and one will slightly disagree, but you get the idea. So let's get started. So the soli are doctrinal ideas for soli, again, plural for sola, are descended from the idea, ideas found in Luther's 95 Thesis. They were not systematically articulated until the 20th century, so well into the 1900s. However, they were all eventually identified and discussed by the various reformers from Luther on. So you would have Luther talk about the necessity of Scripture, and you would have Calvin talk about uh, Scripture only, it's the only source of revelation, and also salvation only comes through Christ. And So they're identifying individual things, but they've not given a name, or they've not co codified them. Um at first, the systemic articulation of the soul, I recognized only that there were three of them. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fides, and Sola Gratia. Uh, scripture alone, faith alone, grace alone. And again, this was early 1900s. I think it was 1916, 1917. That these were articulated by an author, and I, I should have put in who, but I, I, I could not remember. Well, I did not remember to. I did not think to. Over the years, they've had various definitional understandings and the addition and at times the exclusion of various soli. So they have changed in the decades since the first three. As presently constituted um, in this arrangement, in 1965, there were five sola. Sola Scriptura, Sola Fide, Sola Gratia, Solus Christus, and uh, Soli Deo Gloria. And we'll get into each one of these later. Uh, but they're attributed to Johann Baptist Metz in his work, The World and the Church. And it looks like just about all the churches except these five. And again, we're talking thousands of denominations. So, 
And while these are standard to the Protestant and reformist movements, it needs to be said that each denomination might have a slight twist. I, again, I need to reiterate this. So please don't go, well, he said this, and yeah, sure, the Baptists think that, but the Presbyterian, again, there can be slight differences, but they tend to agree on them. And then you have some denominations like Arminianism and Calvinism that have additional doctrines that set them apart. Um, and the big thing about the Armenians and the Calvins is they add five other points, each one of them do. And those points have to do about grace and uh, exclusivity or inclusivity of salvation. The Armenians are very much anyone can be saved and grace is available to all and the calvinists go the complete other direction they're like um only god's select will be saved and salvation is available to the select only and you can deny or you cannot deny god's grace because you are chosen by him you're foreordained or predestined or whatever word you want to use and these are things we'll get into later um and I'm sure there are some other denominations out there with additional points of doctrine or clarification. So like I said, these are very general brothers and sisters. This is not specific. So let's move on to what I think is the most foundational of the soli. Uh, and this is sola scriptura. And I say this because if you think back to the Westminster Confessions, uh, the Westminster Confession was valid and of worth only in so far as there was nothing that went against Scripture. So sola scriptura. Sola means only or solely or uh, alone. So sola scriptura by Scripture alone. And the Bible is the sole infallible source of authority for all Christian faith and practice. The Bible is complete, authoritative, and true. All confessions, doctrines, and practices are to be judged by their biblical accuracy and inclusion in the Bible. Revelation ceased with the Bible. It is God's final and authoritative word. God's will for us individually and collectively is found therein. See also Tota Scriptura. All Scripture. Tota Total. All Scripture canon is equal and none is more important than any other. So there's this... Tota Scriptura is a slightly lesser idea, but it's understood everything in the Bible is equally valid and important. No one book or set of verses is more important than another. So, looking at these real quick, the soul, uh, the Bible is a sole infallible source of authority for all Christian faith and practice. And real quick, think back to our articles of faith. And we say the Bible is true insofar as, as it is translated correctly. And the mainstream Christian world finds that incomprehensible and reprehensible. God's word has been preserved. And again, to a point, they're right. Think about how, how lucky we are to have the Bible even as we have it now. It is old. It's been passed through so many hands for translations into Latin and Greek and Aramaic and Hebrew and, and different people in different places have done translations and they've done different takes in the commentary. You, you understand. So it's complete, authoritative, and true. So when we say the Bible is correct insofar as it's translation is correct they cannot accept that because if there's a chance that the bible is wrong then their doctrine is wrong and their understanding of salvation is wrong 
to my mind, and this is just to me, there are those that might argue, but to me, sola scriptura is the foundation upon which everything else is based. Martin Luther, John Calvin, Zwingli, Knox, all these guys, they realized what the problems with the Catholic Church were because of how it did not meet scriptural standards. Uh, there are common scriptures that support sola scriptura. Um, and we need to understand the mainstream Christians, if you watch the videos, God Loves Mormons or Jeff Durbin or Apo Apologia, any of these guys, you can tell they have their Bible down. They know they can come up with 40, 50 different verses to support any one idea or doctrine that they claim is true. So when I give something, don't think all of these guys think of it this way. These are just some of the ones that I saw coming up more commonly. So when we talk about Sola Scriptura, here's one. It's from 2 Timothy 3, 16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So... That's just one version. Some others were Acts 17, 11, 1 Corinthians 4, 6, Mark's, Mark 7, 6 through 9, and many others. And to think about this, why Sola Scriptura, another reason is they saw that tradition outweighed much of what was going on, what was being preached in Scripture. And tradition would be, at times, trump Scripture as far as what the Catholic Church was doing. And they viewed it almost like Christ saw the Pharisees. And this may or may not be fair. It depends on your viewpoint and their viewpoint. But think of how often when Christ would be preaching and the Pharisees come up and say, Well, what about? Well, the Pharisees were big on oral tradition, right? And how often would Christ say, Is it not written? And then give the example. And prove that the Pharisees were in error. So they say, if Christ can refer back to Scripture for correction, if he's relying on Scripture for doctrine, for authority, then is not the Bible supreme for authority? And here's an interesting quote uh, from Martin Luther. And he gave this at the Diet of Worms where he'd been excommunicated, they were giving him a chance to recant and come back to the faith. And at the end of his trial, he says, Unless, therefore, I am convinced by the testimony of Scripture or by the clearest reasoning, unless I am persuaded by means of the passages I have quoted, and he's quoted Scripture, and unless they render my conscience bound by the word of God, I cannot and will not retract, for it is unsafe for a Christian to speak against his conscience. Here I stand. I can do no other. May God help me. Amen. Luther made his position to the Catholic Church clear because of Scripture. For him to recant, he would have to have Scripture come forth that persuaded him he was wrong, or some form of logic and reasoning persuade him that his understanding of the scripture was wrong. And none of those things happened. So he was willing to face death. And that's what they did to heretics back then. Death. He was willing to face death. Okay, let's move on to the next one. And this is sola fide. Sola fide is by faith alone. Man is saved by faith alone. Salvation does not come by works, the law, or any other way. Faith is a gift of God that comes by grace, and it is in this way and no other that salvation is obtained. So, there were problems with the Catholic Church. We'll get into some of these others. But, salvation comes by faith alone. Not the law, and remember that's what Jesus spent much of his time doing, was reminding the Jews 
that the law did not save them. And as LDS, we understand that the law should have pointed them to Christ. But they misinterpreted what the law was doing. So they were adherents to the law and not to the spirit of the law and what it should have meant and signified. Um, not by work. So being baptized does not save you. Uh, performing missionary service does not save you. Um, temple work would not save you. You get the idea. And this is why they have a problem with, you know, it is by grace we are saved after all we can do. And they go, look, the LDS, they're saying they need to do all they can do. Well, no, they're twisting that, that, that scripture's being twisted or misunderstood. We're not saying that it's the things we do, it's by grace. But that we do works. We do partake of the sacrament, and we know why. To remind us, to help us remember our covenants, and Christ, who is the author and finisher of our salvation. We do go on missionary work. Missionary work spreads the gospel. It also builds the faith. God gives us more faith for our works in return. That's and now, see, this is where this is where we get into trouble because we say, well, because you're doing the work, God gives you faith. No, faith is freely given because of grace. And on the understanding we have, and I, I hope I don't phrase this poorly. Brothers and sisters, I do believe we demonstrate our faith through our works. God has called us to a work, right? Just as these reformers would say, God has called them to reform. God has called them to represent him through new ideas of how we read the scriptures, that salvation might be obtained. Joseph Smith is not the author of our salvation. He's the prophet that pointed us to Christ. The Book of Mormon does not save us, but it points us to Christ that we might grow in faith. Same with the prophet that we grow in faith. We identify works as those things which point us to Christ and help us to grow in faith. And when we get into the lectures on faith that I'll have coming up um, soon, we'll better understand how faith is built. Uh, but faith is a gift. We readily acknowledge that. Faith is a gift from God. But if you don't do anything, if you don't testify, if you don't serve, if you don't participate, your faith will never grow. Your love and understanding of Christ will never grow. Works bring us closer to God, but they do not save us. There, I think that's a good way to put it. Works point us to God and help us to better understand and love Him, but do not save us. It is grace. Uh, so some of the common scriptures on this include, so they include Galatians 1.9, Galatians 2.16, Ephesians 2, 8-9, Romans 4, 4 through 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, Galatians again, 3, 6 through 11, and many others. And let's just take one of these. How about Galatians 2, 16? Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. So there you go justification, faith, they intertwine, they build upon each other, but it's all by faith, not by the works of the law, because you're not justified by works or by the law. Faith justifies you. Coming to Christ, you are justified as your faith is built and grown. Um, 
and let's I would also use this time to think back to King Benjamin's speech um, where he talks about oh if you go and do this are you justified no because what you've done and then you've been blessed in this way and therefore you're more in debt to God to me if we could get our mainstream brethren into the Book of Mormon and if they could read King Benjamin's speech they would better understand how we view faith and works that no matter what you do you're blessed by God and therefore still in debt <laughs> right you're always in debt um, I, I think that would help our, our brothers and sisters in mainstream Christianity with a sola fide and also the uh, the next one soli gratia sola gratia by grace alone and so here this is the biblical acknowledgement that our salvation is a gift of grace from God. If we reject God's grace, we are in fact rejecting the gospel and salvation. And this is again where you get back to Armenianism and Calvinism. Armenians say everyone can receive God's grace. And the Calvins will say only the select and elect whom God foreordained will receive his grace. Uh, so you can, and they say that the the elect cannot reject grace because they're elect and God will force it on them. The Armenians the other way are like anyone can accept it and you can also reject it, but they all agree if you reject it, you reject salvation. So God's favor is not earned or bought. It is given to you his grace and the gift of that grace is shown through faith. as we talked about earlier. The Bible teaches that our hearts are wicked and deceitful, from Jeremiah. <coughs> Excuse me. And that there is none righteous that understands, that seeks after God. And that's Romans 3, 10 through 11. So with such a wicked nature, we're consigned to spiritual death. And without God's grace and his gift of faith, we're, faith, we're lost. So we're born wicked. We seek after wickedness. We're going to pursue wickedness. And it's God and his grace that intercedes, that saves us. Um, and it's offered as a free gift. And we can accept it or we can reject it. Now, I don't, you put in, you notice here, I don't have on how you receive God's grace because there's not a lot of agreement on that. And it's so varied, I'm just going to leave that alone. Because some of it's you come unto him and you acknowledge God and you're baptized. Some of it, well, you, the baptisms are works. So you just need to say the sinner's prayer or the prayer of repentance or the Jesus prayer. Uh, some of them you just need to acknowledge in your heart. Some of them. So I'm not going into how grace is received or rejected. But there's the basic premise. Without grace, there is no salvation. God offers you grace. You can, recite, you can accept it or receive it, generally speaking. Again, Calvinists would say different. Uh, common scriptures supporting sola gratia. Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. Romans 5, verse 8. Luke 19, 10. And John 6, 39. And again, there are many others. So let's look at one of these, shall we? So let's just look at that first one there, Ephesians 2. For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So again, you get back into, ah, uh -uh, you didn't do anything to deserve it. You did not work for this. God gave it to you as a gift because of faith. But also faith is the gift. And you get the idea. Um, amazing grace was inspired by the concept of sola gratia. Um, that should surprise nobody. All right, let's keep going. All right, now we come to solus Christus. And I think this is one where there is more common ground between us and mainstream 
modern Christian churches. They just don't think we think this. And I do think there have been some problems in the past with us expressing it correctly because we have... There has been a time where we did place an emphasis on doing works. But in the LDS world, we understood works point us to God. Works build our faith. But for them, they're like, look, they think works save them. But we in the church, we know different. We understand different. It's just a, it's, it's a matter of perspective and context and understanding. So, solus Christus, through Christ alone. Um, it can also be referred to as uh, solo Cristo. Basically the same thing. It's just, how do you like your Latin? Because <laughs> it's still Christ alone. By Christ alone, through Christ alone. You get the idea. Uh, reformers place the emphasis on the idea of being saved by Christ alone due to the idea that others may intercede on our behalf. So, of course, works can save you. But they also thought, with some righteous indignation, I would think here, because there is some acknowledgement in the Catholic Church that Mary can intercede on your behalf. Uh, the saints can intercede on your behalf. The Pope, the Pope, excuse me, a priest, uh, name it. Christ alone offers salvation. See, this is where they think, you think Joseph Smith saves you. No, we think Joseph Smith points us to Christ and that Christ saves us. But they look at our veneration of Joseph Smith as something akin to the veneration of Christ. And that's just not so. But they also see the Pope in that way. Uh, this is why they also deny works. Because people would say, I'm saved because the priest gave me Eucharist. Or we would say, I received sacrament from a deacon. That's a work. Um, no. Salvation in and through Christ alone. Again. Christ is the author and finisher of our salvation. Um, <clears throat> so you get works, you get law, but also you get other people. So they try and do away with any idea that it's other people that have anything to do with your salvation. It is Christ alone. So scripture supporting solus Christus, Revelations 19.16, Hebrews 4.14, Galatians 3.13, 1 Timothy 2.5, Titus 3.5, and Romans 3.22, and many others. And so let's look at one of these real quick. How about Galatians 3.13? Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. So he was cursed for us because he was convicted. He was tried. He was wrongfully executed. He took his sin, our sins upon himself on our behalf. We had nothing to do with it. We did nothing to earn this. Christ alone is the author and finisher, again, of our salvation. And I think that's one that the LDS would readily acknowledge. But maybe sometimes we do a poor job stating it in just our common everyday vernacular. When we talk about you know, our religion, but when we really get into the weeds, it's no, no, it's all through Christ. Okay. And this is a quote from Luther. I must listen to the gospel. It tells me not what I must do, but what Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has done for me. Uh, that's from his book, Commentaries on Galatians. I, I really, I, I rather like that quote myself. Uh, so let's move on to our last sola, shall we? Soli Deo Gloria. And soli Deo Gloria means glory only to God, or glory to God only. Uh, this sola has reference to the fact that God alone can claim the glory of our salvation and the gift of His grace. We have no claim on any glory as our works, merit, boasting, and pride have done nothing for us. We have done nothing to obtain the gift of faith or grace. So the glory is to God alone. 
Um, so when we think about glory, we think about maybe Moses. This is my work and my glory, right? Bring immortality and eternal life. That's God's glory. It's not ours. As we receive salvation, as we enter into exaltation, God's glory increases. We don't think of glory the way they do, though. We don't boast about getting into heaven. We don't boast about, oh, I went and I helped an old lady cross the street today. Boy, God sure loves me more today than he did yesterday. We don't, we don't do that. But you would get some people. It, it, this is a way of making sure that people understand. Nothing you've done has affected your grace or brought you closer to God, to being saved. Right? That's what grace is. Grace is the salvation offered. We, as Latter-day Saints, acknowledge God. We acknowledge our dependence upon Him. We acknowledge that without His Son, we could not enter into heaven. That we need His grace. We need faith. Works don't get us there. But we do acknowledge works build our faith. So... Here are some of the common scriptures that support uh, soli deo gloria. So for this one, th they do a great job of pointing some specific scripture. Uh, one of the ones I like, though, is they say Daniel 3, and that's the entirety of the chapter. And you think about it, this is where um, Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, uh, refuse to bow down to an idol. And they're ordered to be thrown into a fiery furnace. And this furnace is so hot, it's killing guards <laughs> that are marching them to the furnace. And they get into the furnace, and they survive untouched. Not even the smell of the smoke is upon them. And they readily acknowledge it was God that made this happen. That if they lived or died, it was according to the will of God. And they lived because God willed it to happen. They had nothing to do with it, right? That's the quick reinterpretation. And that's one of the ways modern mainstream Christianity views sola deo gloria. God alone saves. Therefore, give God the glory. Um, and then one of the things I like is Johann Sebastian Bach. At the bottom of each one of his works, he would place the initials SDG, Soli Deo Gloria. Um, Bach believed music was a gift from God. And so every piece he turned out, he wanted to give glory to God. To give thanks for the gift of being able to create music. I I think that's beautiful. I forgot where I read that at, but now there are sometimes additional soli discussed, but they're not mainstream. They're not widely accepted. But you get solo caritas, charitable love, solo ecclesia, the church alone, solo spiritus, the spirit alone. Um but these, again, not widely. I'm not going to go into any of these. You can look at that and go, because we talk about charity, right? The pure love of Christ. We talk about not so much the church. We talk about the church as an institution, but not as a means of salvation. I mean, it's, it's where we worship. It's where we gather. It's where we discuss Christ. But you get the idea. Um, anyway, brothers and sisters, that's it for this video. A small discussion on the sola. The soli. Um, I hope you enjoyed. Thank you for listening. Thank you. And have a good day. Peace out.